Now we are in the midst of the uh, Gimel de Poranusa, the three half Torahs that are uh, said during the three weeks, Divrei Yirmiyahu, Shimu Dvar Hashem, and Chazon Yishayahu Ben Amotz. I was thinking this year that if we take those first words of the Haftorah and understand them to be a uh, program of how to correct all that happened during uh, all the Churbanos and what caused them. And the last Churban, Sinashin on the Chafetz Chaim says is Lashon Hara. Sinashin and Lashon Hara are, are the same. We'll be able to understand how to correct the situation and turn these days into Yemei Simcha v'yomim tovim. Start with Divrei Yirmiyahu. Person first has to appreciate the importance of words. Sometimes we think that words, what are words, you know, when you were a kid, said that uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Words can hurt. And words have tremendous power. And the first you sold of being able to correct whatever uh, has come till this day is to appreciate the power of words in many ways. First of all, to appreciate the power of words of Divrei Torah. How important Torah is, even though it's only words. Divrei Tefillah, Tefillah's words. But what is the power of Tefillah? And finally, Divrei Tochacha, hearing Musar, hearing inspiring words, is just words. If you appreciate the power of words and you appreciate the power of what Tochacha is and what Musar is also. Chazal say, Adam la'om al yulad, Pasuk and Eve. Man was created to toil. The Eni Odea, the Gemara says, Im la'om al malacha, Im la'om al sicha. What, is, what was he created to toil? To work, physical labor, or to talk? Pasuk, Gemara brings a Pasuk. Ki ika falof piyu, om al sicha, om al peh. Maybe it's created Islam to talk. Torah brings a posseh. Tell me that it's Amal HaTorah. Says the Chafetz Chaim, what's the Havah mean? Somebody thought the person was created to stop physical work. And if you know already it's not physical work, it's talking. Somebody was created just to talk. That was the purpose of creation. People should talk. You need a posseh to tell me that's talking about Divrei Torah. Says the Chafetz Chaim, the Maral says the idea of Amal is that the Rabban Shem created an imperfect world. And he wants us to perfect it. Turnus Rufus HaRasha once asked Rabbi Akiva, what's better? What a Kaddish Baruch Hu makes or what human beings make? And he expected Rabbi Akiva, of course, to say what the Rabban Shem makes is better than what people make. And then he would have attacked him and said, if that's the case, then we Goyim are better than you Yidin. Because we Goyim are uncircumcised like God made us, and you Jews are circumcised like a mole made you. You're man-made. We're God-made. So Rabbi Akiva surprised him, and he said, of course, what people make is better than what God makes. He says, how you talking? He says, you're going home to eat lunch. Your wife made cake and bread, and the Rabbana Shalom made wheat. You take your choice. I'll take the cake and bread over the wheat all the time. Meaning... The Rabban Hashem created an unfinished, imperfect world, the raw materials. And he expects us to take those raw materials and develop them and perfect them. That's the purpose of the world. Some say that's what it means, Asher Bara Elohim La Asos. The Rabban Hashem created a world in its imperfect state, La Asos, that man should continue and finish it and perfect it and develop it. Says the Chafetz Chaim, part of that development is physical labor. Developing the world. Perfecting the world in a physical way. So yeah, Adam la'om al-yulad. He was created to toil 
to take the potential and actualize it and realize it. It's very important to perfect and develop the world, but that's not the ikr. The ikr is to use your mouth because the Rabbana Shalom, when he created the world, this whole world, the physical world, is the result of Kibidvar Hashem Shamaim Nasu. So the Rabbana Shalom's Dibur, that's what all the material world is. So it's a person's Dibur that's the main thing. He develops and perfects the world through speech. So I might think almost Sicha. Sicha is very important. Sicha can mean communication. You know how you develop the world when people get together and they're able to communicate? Then they can see to it the society develops, the world is perfected. We know what happened at Migdal Bavel when they couldn't communicate. And they couldn't develop and couldn't build. Sicha can also mean ain't Sicha la davening. What can a person accomplish with davening and perfecting the world? Tremendous. And all of that is very important. Sicha can also mean that you speak and strengthen people and things. Speak goodly, positively about the things in the world and give people chizik. It's also sicha. All very important ways of developing and perfecting the world. But that's still not the ikr. The ikr is omal ha-Torah. Torah, words of Torah are the main Thing that develops and creates the perfection of the world. Because the Rabbanishim created this world with Dibor, with the Osio Satora, and that's the way that man continues to develop the world. What? The Koach HaTorah. Chavetz Chaim says that it appears that people who are involved in creating material realities physical realities, they're the ones who are really building and perfecting this world. People are developing cures for diseases. People are building bridges and building skyscrapers. That's reality. Torah, somebody sitting over a Gemara and learning, what is he accomplishing? Kovitz Chaim gives a marshal. Says there was once a very wealthy man who wanted to have the most luxurious yacht built for him. And he hired an architect and a builder, and he told them, I want you to build me the most luxurious boat that ever existed. And I'm telling you now that if anything on that boat is not luxurious, I'm not going to pay you a penny. So you better make sure that everything is luxurious, nothing's plain. So they finished the yacht, and they brought this man to inspect it before they got paid. So they took him to the staterooms. Everything was carpeted with uh, plush, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, the bathroom fixtures were solid gold. Beautiful, luxurious. They took them to the ballrooms, the dining rooms, all of it, plush, luxurious. Finally, they took him down underneath bottom floor of the boat, and he passes by a room where he sees a regular doorknob. He sees smoke coming out of the bottom of the door. Doesn't look like there's any carpeting in there. He says, I suspect that that room, there's something not luxurious. And I wanted it opened up right now. So they opened the room, and sure enough, there's no carpeting on the floor. It's all sooty and dirty. Smoke is coming out from the door. A door is a plain, ordinary door, an iron door with a regular doorknob. He says, look, I'll do you a favor. I'm giving you 24 hours to get this room out of my boat, or I don't pay you a penny. So they took the engine room out of the boat, and the boat sank. The engine room may not look as luxurious and impressive as the rest of the boat, but without the engine room, there is no boat. If it wouldn't be for the words of Torah, it's not just that if Klai saw weren't Makabal the Torah, then the world would have gone back to Tova Vo. But Reb Chaim Velozhner says every second, what keeps this world going, what's the energy source of the entire world is Torah. And that is the real reality, just as much as Dvar Hashem is the reality we see, the physical material world is the result of Dvar Hashem, it's Dvar Hashem, Torah, that keeps the world going. It's more of a reality 
And as people say, they want people who are sitting and learning Torah to do something constructive. So they should go into construction. No offense to people who are in construction. But that's their hasaga. Foolish. They think building a building is more real than what a person creates and keeps the world going with Divrei Torah. Or another foolish person who said that he would like to see B'nai Torah instead of sitting and learning, they should go and clean the streets. That's more real than sitting and learning Torah. Afro the Pumayu. Foolish people. That's their perspective. That's what they think is real in this world. So a person first has to appreciate the power of words. Words are more real and more important than physical realities. It's more of a reality. Physical reality exists in this world. Next world, there's no physical material things, no skyscrapers, nobody cleaning the streets. Divrei Torah is eternal. This world, the next world, lenetzach netzachim. And that's what started this world, and that's what became the physical reality of the world, and that's what keeps this physical reality going. Divrei Torah. Similarly, they once wanted to uh, build a hospital, a Jewish-run hospital, in the area around Raden, after World War I. The... Uh, Chafetz Chaim and other gedolim of the time saw that there are many, many Jews who, because of the, the, the uh, uh, ravages of World War I, uh, were sickly, needed hospital care, and the Goyesha hospitals didn't take care of the Jews too well. So they wanted to build a Jewish-run hospital, and they were situated in the area around Raden. So the Chafetz Chaim called a meeting for all of the wealthy people of that area, and he wanted to show them how important the meeting was. He scheduled it in the base Medrash in Raden. Didn't have too many meetings in the base Medrash in Raden, but in order to let these people know this is important enough to have in the base Medrash, that's where he scheduled the meeting. And all the rich people of the area came, and uh, they were supposed to uh, hear the Chafetz Chaim plead with them, an impassioned plea for the importance of this hospital, and then they were to get up and uh, make their pledges of how many beds they would support in this hospital. And each bed represented a certain amount of money. So one person got up and he said five beds, another one ten beds. Finally came the time to the richest man of the area and everybody was waiting with bated breath. How many beds is he going to donate? The man gets up and he looks and he sees in the back of the base Medrash there's a young Avreich sitting and learning. So he figured he wants to make a joke. So he said, I will donate 10 times as many beds as that man in the back will donate. Everybody started laughing. That guy couldn't afford a pillowcase, let alone a bed. So everybody laughed. The Chafetz Chaim got up, livid, banged on the stender, turns to this rich man and says, you couldn't give one hundredth of what that Avreich could give towards a hospital in Raden. Everybody was shocked. This guy is probably the richest man, richer than this guy, and he doesn't look like such a rich person. Because it's time, so let me explain. What could you give? Ten beds, a hundred beds, to take care of the sick people in this area? That man with his divrei Torah can assure there won't be any sick people in this area. That, with all the money in the world, you can't do. That's the reality of Torah. So everything starts with divrei Yirmiyahu. Appreciate dvarim. Appreciate tefillah, appreciate Torah, appreciate divrei musr and divrei tochacha. We see that in the sedris. Parshas Pinchas sometimes is also where they have Torah of divrei Yirmiyahu. Surely Parshas Matos Masse teach us the importance of words. Parshas Pinchas, we're told about the Karbonos Sibur. The power of Karbonos. The world exists the power of Karbonos. What do we have today that takes the place of Karbonos? On the Shalma Parim Sfosenu. Words. Words take the place of Karbonos. Matus Masse starts with the Parish of Sanadorim. Lo Yachel Dvara. Words are important. They're a reality. Not Stam. They disappear into the air. Lo Yachel Dvara. What you speak, what you say is real. And then... Man milchemes midyon, elef lamata, elef lamata. One thousand from each tribe were sent to be soldiers. 
to go and fight Midian. Bidvar Hashem, Mochemus Mitzvah. And Elif Lamate, Elif Lamate, the Medrash says 1,000 were sent to Davin and to learn. And they were sent with the soldiers to the battlefield. Rubchatzko Levinstein says they didn't go because they had a Davin and learn because they needed Siata Deshmaya to win. This was a war the Rabbanu told them to go fight. They were fighting on their own. So if the Rabbanu Shalom doesn't want them to go, he won't tell them to go. He told them to go. So he's obviously going to give them Siata Deshmaya. They weren't davening for Siata Deshmaya. They were davening because the davening is the war. Because just as much as you need a sword or a gun or a missile, you need tefillah, you need Torah. It's the same thing. And therefore they went to provide that arsenal, that weaponry, which is just as real as the gun. That's divrei Torah. And therefore you needed a ratio of one to one, Chaim Shmulevet says. For every one who had a gun, you needed one who was saying divrei Torah and what's it called, and, uh, and tefillah. Because the reality of the gun is not as strong as the reality of divrei Torah and divrei tefillah. I was thinking, perhaps that's another understanding of what Chazal say, Ameh of the Haaretz, al ozvam es Torosi shlo berchu batorah tefillah. The reason the Churban came is because they didn't make a bracha, a bracha lefaneha and divrei Torah. All different ideas, what that means. I was thinking perhaps what it means is the following. There are certain things that we do that are mitzvahs that we don't make a bracha on. Things that basically are only diburin, bitl chametz. You don't make a bracha on bitl chametz. One of the reasons is because it's only diburim, it's only talk, not an action. And even those things that we, when we say words, we make a brach on it because you have to say words from a, sep, a special place, special words. You read Megillah Esther, it has to be from a Megillah, it has to be what's it called, certain words. So then it has already something to make a brach on. Some words, some things that are just talking, you don't make a brach on that. Klal Yisrael didn't appreciate the power of Torah, that it's a reality. So lo berchu ba Torah, you don't make a brach on words. And because they didn't appreciate how real it was, how it's not just a bunch of words, but it's the real reality of this world, and therefore they weren't machshiv Torah, and because they weren't machshiv Torah, all the, the things that caused the Churban ended up destroying Klal Yisrael. And as much as we realize the power of words for the positive, how words can create, and words are reality. The opposite's also true. It says that, There are certain things that transcend time and place and are real eternally. And Talmud Torah can get cool on the real reality is Talmud Torah. Yushalmi says the opposite side of the coin. There are three things a person is punished in this world and in the next world. Because the negative reality transcends time and place. And they are Gili Arayis, Shvichas Domim, and Avodah Zara, Veloshin Hora, Keneget Kulam. Just as much as Talmud Torah, Keneget Kulam on this side, Loshin Hora, Keneget Kulam. Because same idea. The words of Torah are the strongest reality, and the words of Lashon Hara are the strongest destruction of reality. So that is the um, first stage. Divrei Yirmiyahu. Appreciate Dvorim. Appreciate words. Second stage. Shimu Dvar Hashem. Okay, now I appreciate words. I have to listen. If words are so important, then I should pay attention to them. But it's not just pay attention, something more than that. It says in the Torah, Cain and Hevel bring Karbonos. Cain's Karbon is not accepted and Hevel's is. Cain is very upset. Really upset. And he really thinks that his brother cheated him out 
because his brother was accepted. That's why he wasn't accepted. So the Rabbana Shalom gives him the first Musa Shmuz of history. And he tells him, look, Kayan, imtative says, if you'll better your ways, then you'll be forgiven and you'll be up there on top too. It's not your brother or you, both of you could be. Don't blame him. The imlotative, and if you don't better your ways, the Pesachatas Rovesi Yitzhahar is waiting for you. First Musa Shmuz in history. Next Pesach says, Vayomer Kayan of Hevelachi. Cain said something to Hevel. And then when they were out in the field, Cain got up and he killed Hevel. So the Medrashim say, there's something obviously missing here. What happened between the time the Rabban Shem gave him Musr, and he said something to Hevel, and then he was out in the field and killed Hevel. So the Medrashim have a tremendous amount of what Cain said to Hevel that led him to kill him. They were arguing about the Arusha, who's going to get the Beis Hamikdash, who's going to get Eretz Israel, who's going to get the movable property, who's going to... They, they, they were the only ones in the world. Kai and Adam and Chav are not going to live forever. So what are we going to get? What's our Yerusha? They were already arguing about the Arusha. And after they were arguing and they got heated up, Cain killed Hevel. Beautiful, makes sense. Says the Ibn Ezra, what's Pashib shot in the Pasuk? You have to be able to understand the Pasuk without Midrashim. What, what's, if you learn just the plain Pashib shot in the Pasuk, what did Cain say to Hevel that's not Iker Chasim and Asafer? He says, simple. You know what Cain told Hevel? He told him the Musr that God just told him. He told it over to him. Now that doesn't make sense. Because the sequence is because Cain told Hevel what he told him, then when they're in the field, he killed him. Here's just the opposite. If Cain told Hevel the Musr he just heard from the Rabban Shalom, that shouldn't be a reason why he should kill him. The sequence doesn't go. Well, that's the idea. You know what Cain did? I'll tell you. When I was a much younger rabbi, my first pulpit in Miami, so I had Balabatim who were older than me, who were professionals, and sometimes I had to give them Musr, and I felt intimidated. I couldn't face them face to face and tell them what really they had to be told. So I figured, you know, I'll do this in an in a easier way. I'll put it in my Shabbos drasha. Not where it's clear that who I'm talking about, but they'll for sure get the message. And I'll, you know, get the message across. Somebody did something in the Kehillah during the week. I'll put it in my Shabbos drasha, and the guy will get the message. I don't have to speak to him face to face. I'll get the message from the Shabbos. One Shabbos, I gave one of these fire and brimstone drushas, right? directed at one person who did something, wasn't obvious, wasn't uh, embarrassing him publicly, at least I didn't think then, then that was happening. But in any case, whatever the truth was, the Rabban Hashem knows. But in any case, the, um, and I figured this guy surely got the message. The end of davening, people come over to say good Shabbos, and I see this guy coming with a big smile on his face. Comes over, he says, Rabbi, good Shabbos, I really enjoyed that drasha. And I hope the people who needed that message got the message. I'm thinking to myself, I'm sure they didn't. It was you. You really gave it to them. It was them. It's you. But that's how people see, you know. So Kayan heard this tremendous muster from the Rabban Shalom. And he said, you know, it's really a great word. But I don't need that. There's only one other guy around. I'm sure the Rabban Shalom wanted me to tell Hevel, I'm sure he could use that muster. So because Cain said, you really gave it to them. God, thanks for telling me that because I really think my brother could use it. And he told it over to Hevel and didn't take it personally. Because of that, Vayokim Cain Vayargus Hevelachim. If he understood and listened and paid attention to what the Rabban Hashem was saying and didn't think it was just there to pass on to Hevel, he wouldn't have killed Hevel. I think that's what the Ibn Ezra means. You know, it says that in Evid Ivri, so after six years, which is supposed to be a punishment for him for selling himself as a slave or for stealing and being sold as a slave, and after six years, he says, I like this. Not a punishment. I, don't I, I go for more. Right? I like to stay in this situation. So then we take him out and we pierce his ear, his earlobe, because Ozen Shishom al Har Sinai, Lo Signov, O Avodai Heim, right? And he went and sold himself as a slave or he went and stole. So now we pierce his ear. It always bothered me. If you ever learned anatomy, physiology, you know that this part of the ear doesn't hear anything. You can cut this off, you'll hear perfectly. This is just cartilage. The ear hears is the inner ear. 
So why don't we take an awl and knock out his inner ear? I mean, what's what the Rosham saying? You know, okay, I guess God is more merciful than I am. And therefore, he just takes it, you know, symbolically or whatever. That's the part of the ear you see. But I think I have a better answer. This part of the ear, the Gemara says, is called an afarcheses. Afarcheses means a funnel. If you didn't have the outer ear, the sound would just pass you by. This collects the sound and directs it towards you. This guy heard on Harsin Ilo Signov, and he heard Avodai Haim, but it was this part of the ear that was the problem. He didn't realize God's talking to him. Oh, yeah, he's talking. That's to them, not me. So it's this part of the ear that was the problem. That's the part that you... Ozen Shishama. It didn't say Ozen Shaloshama by Harsinai. Ozen Shishama. He heard, but he didn't listen. He didn't pay attention. He didn't realize that the Rabbanish was talking to him. And if you listen and you pay attention, you can hear the Rabbanish speaking all the time. Every single one of you has heard the Rabbanish speaking to you very recently. How many of you have heard the Rabbanish speaking to you recently? All of you. What do you think you're hearing now? And that's not a haughty statement. I'm just a pipeline telling you Divrei Torah, Divrei Chazal. They're not talking to you either. They're telling you Dvar Hashem. So God is speaking to you right now. You don't need me. Open up a Chumash. Open up a Mishnah. Open up a Gemara. You know who's speaking to you? The Rabbanu Shalom. I think sometimes the Rambam in Pirush Mishnayis says, Omer Ab Yehuda, Anasi, Omer HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They're not talking. They're, they're, they're just a pipeline for Dvar Hashem. So God's talking to you. That's why it says, Kol Godol Velo Yosef. The Rabbanu Shalom is broadcasting Torah from Har Sinai every day. It's in the air. It's like radio waves. They're there. They're all over us. If you have a radio and you turn it on and you tune into the right station, you'll get it. It's all here. We don't hear it because we don't have a radio. We don't turn it on and we don't tune in. So the airwaves of Matan Torah is constantly being broadcast from Har Sinai. Except you have to have the receiving station and you have to tune in and put up the volume and you'll hear it. That's why it says in Pirkei Ovos, Bechol Yom V'yom Bas Kol Yotzei Mehar Choreif. That's the call that's broadcast. But you don't hear that, so then the echo comes out. And the echo says, Oy no lebrios me'al bono shel Torah. What a bizarre. The Rebono is broadcasting. He has one station. Nobody's tuning in. That's al bono shel Torah. So you can hear the Dvar Hashem if you listen carefully and you tune in and you put your ear to... Be collate those, uh, those things all constantly. The Rabbanus was talking to all of us. You don't even need that. Hashamayim is Go outside, look up in the heavens, and God's talking to you. Hashamayim is saprim kvot keil. Anybody hear it? People in, in, a, in, in what's it called, studying astronomy and planetariums. Well, they hear plenty of things, but they don't hear the Rabbanus speaking. You don't even need that. My heart speaks to me in the name of Hashem, Rashi says, and says, Bakshu Panai. You ever hear that? Go to the doctor, let him take a stethoscope, put it on your heart. If he hears Bakshu Panai, you're right away in the intensive care unit. I guarantee you. What does he hear? Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. But that's not what your heart's saying. If you tune in with the right ears, you hear Bakshu Panai. You know, you need that. Chazal say constantly in Pirkei Avos, Hu ha Omer. What do you think this guy went around always saying this thing? Right? How many times did he say it? Hu ha Omer. Some say it doesn't mean he said it at all. It means if you looked at him and you saw his character, his being, he tells you something. But for that, you need to get the right broadcast. That's why in Parshish Matos, it also speaks about the Yisim, the Kiyam, the Hashem, the Yisrael, and Don the Katskos. Because if you look at other people and you don't give them the benefit of the doubt, then you get the wrong message from them. You don't hear what they're broadcasting in the name of Hashem. Everybody has some kind of broadcast. And if you're not donem lekafschos, you don't hear what's proper. Everybody has his Torah. There's, on one hand, you have to judge people favorably. On the other hand, they have to do things that don't give you the reason to suspect them wrongly. Mayor Shapiro says, Uvisoroso Yege Yom Everybody has their Torah. And when everybody keeps their Torah, 
the world is a good place. The problem is when everybody keeps everybody else's Torah. This is an, an example. You have a person who makes a loan, he loans money to someone, and someone who, who lends the money, and somebody who takes the loan, who borrows the money. There's the lender and the borrower. Each one has his Torah. The lender's Torah is don't take interest, don't pressure the guy if you know he can't pay. The borrower's Torah is scrimp and save, pay back on time, be makir tova to the person who gave you the loan. When everybody keeps their Torah, the lender is saying, I better not put any pressure on this guy, right? And I better not pressure him to pay me back, and I better not take interest from him. And the borrower is saying, I better scrimp and save and pay him back and be makir tova. Fine. Shalom al Yisrael. You know when the problem is? When the lender is saying, hey, you better scrimp and save and pay me back on time, and you better be makir tova. And the, the borrower is saying, hey, you better not pressure me and not take any interest from me. Then, when there's not betorah so yege, so I have to judge you favorably, but you have to make sure not to give me reason to suspect you. So when I'm judging you favorably and you're careful not to give me reason to suspect you, everything's fine. But when I'm saying, what's it called? Uh, hey, I can do whatever I want and I can make you suspicious of me, but you better judge me with the cops close. And the other guy's saying, you better not give me reason to be suspicious of you, then there's problems. So if you want to get the real message from other people, you have to tune into the right station in the right way and give a person the benefit of the doubt and at the same time, don't try to broadcast things that seem to be suspicious. And lastly, after you appreciate the power of words, divrei yirmiyoh, and shimu dvar Hashem, and not only you appreciate words, but you hear them, and you know they're directed towards you, then comes chazon yishayoh. It's not enough merely to hear and to appreciate the power of words, but you have to have a chazon, a vision. You have to be able to see it in its entirety. You have to be able to see it not piecemeal, to see the whole picture. Like we heard from the first speaker, if you only look at a small portion, you see distortion. But if you take the whole person, right, the whole person, I was thinking while he was speaking, the Rabbanu is called Mekomo Shalolam, but he's not in the world. He's Mekomo Shalolam. Until you can be Mekomo Shalolam and be kolal everything, don't judge anybody else. Because you have to be able to see the whole picture, and only the Rabbanu Shalolam, who's Mekomo Shalolam, can see the whole picture. You occupy a certain space here. You can see what's around your space. You can't see everything that's outside of that space. So you're only Roy to be done, somebody else, when you see the whole picture. And that's why Parshish Matos says that Moshe Rabbeinu got angry, he forgot his learning, and and he forgot to tell them the parsha of, uh, of Hechsher Kalim. El Ozer had to do it. It's not a punishment. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't do anything wrong. He got angry for a good reason. And that's why the Masos, you have to see the whole picture. It wasn't enough each piecemeal journey they made, but how it related to the one before it and the one after it and all of them together. And that's how to look at, uh, at, at Tochach and Musa, the Rabbanus was giving them Musa by 40 years in the desert. And each Masa added a little bit to that. And therefore, you have to think. The Churban came because Ami lo his bonon, they didn't think. And to think, you have to see the whole picture. You have to think into every prat. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu gave them Musr, Eila Hadvarim. So he hinted to them all the places they sinned. But right after that, I told them right out all the places they sinned. What was the, the Kvodan Shal Yisrael? I was thinking the Pshats like this. Kvodan Shal Yisrael is not to tell people you did this wrong and that wrong or whatever, and they don't think about it and finish. That's the end. That's not Musr. Musr is, I'm going to give you a hint. And you start thinking about what I'm hinting. And when you think deeply into it, then I'll be able to tell you right out what it was and it'll make an impression. But if you don't bother to think, right, then all the muscle I can give you is worthless. So first we're going to give you a lot of hints and now you're going to have to start thinking, what am I hinting at? And you'll think into it, then you'll think into it and then I'll tell you it together. What I'm telling you, what you're thinking will affect something. And for that you need manhigim. You need a divrei yirmiyahu and a chazon yishayahu. 
That's why the um, Levim, on the one hand, the Levim were separated from the Jewish people. They weren't counted together with them. They didn't live amongst them. But they're supposed to be the leaders. They're supposed to be the ones who are mashpia. A leader has to be, to a certain degree, distanced from you. You have to look up to him. Always like the time of the Jewish people, everyone is like a letter in the Torah. The Levium are like the lines above the letters. They look, give something to letters to look up and keep them straight. But they're separate from the letters. They're not mixed in with the rest of the letters. At the same time, the cities of the Levium were the Are Miklat for murderers, Bishogate, and the Are Miklat were Are Halavium, meaning that it works both ways. As much as a levy has to be separate and above and distanced, because if he's just your friend, your rav is your friend, your teacher is your friend, and in America now parents are their friends. You're supposed to treat your parents like friends. Call them Jack and Jane, not mommy and daddy, Jack and Jane. That's their name, right? So a kid like that has two new friends and no parents. He's a yosem with two friends, two extra friends. But they're not parents. Parents have to be authority figures. They can be your friends, they can be very friendly. Be very friendly parents, but you have to be parents. You can be a very friendly rav, but you have to be a rav. If you're your congregant's friend, then they have an extra friend, they have no rav. So the levium have to be separate and distanced. At the same time, they have to be sensitive to the lowest strata of society, the people who go around killing people unintentionally. And the people who kill unintentionally have to look up to the levium as their kapara. There has to be a connection, but there has to be also a distance. And lastly, in order for the Dvarim and the Shmiya and the Hisbonanus to take effect, like we heard, and I'm not going to belabor the point, you have to be a positive person. Bilam had one eye. All he saw was negative. It says the Svarno says that when Balak invited Bilam to come and curse the Jewish people, he said, Ki yodati es asher tevarech yuvmevorach v'asher or you are. I know whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. So Svarno says, if he knew that he gave you blessings, then why did he hire Bilam to curse the Jewish people? He should have hired him to bless him. Says the Svarno, Bilam had no power of blessing anybody. He only had power of curse. Curse means, what's a blessing? A blessing is you take something positive and you increase it. Borech, brecha, you increase it, intensify it. Klal is the opposite, kal. You take some negative thing and you make it even more negative and more weak. You weaken something negative, a weakness. You capitalize on the weakness and here you capitalize on the strength. Bilam only had the power to know when God was angry and capitalize on that weakness, on that negative. He couldn't bless anybody. So why did, why did Balak say, Ashir tevorech because he thought it would be very insulting and, in, and insulting to Abilam to say that you're a negative person. All you can do is curse people. So he lied and he said, I know you could bless people too, because it would be very insulting to Bilam to be considered a negative person. And yet many people, right, from people, consider themselves very special because they can curse people and because they can be negative. It's a bizarre for Abilam to be negative. Why isn't it bizarre for us? Bilam had one eye, Shasuma, all I can see was negative. You need two eyes. You need one eye to be critical, and you need another eye to be able to see that criticism in a positive way, constructive criticism. I'll end with just a mice. I've said it, I think, before. But I think it's a gewaltig thing, something to think about. Rabbi Lazar and his father, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, were in a cave for 12 years, learning, davening, nothing else. The Rabbanishim took care of their parnos, didn't have to do anything. They ate haruvim for 12 years, which by me is a big nace as itself. How in the world can you survive on haruvim? Right, even on Tu how in the world do you eat that stuff? But in any case, they survived on it for 12 years with a be'er. They came out of the cave, and wherever they looked, they burnt up. Critic, critical. They see people wasting their time. What are you doing being osik in chai Plowing, planting, harvesting. Who needs that? Go learn, go daven. That's what we did for 20, 12 years. What are you wasting your time on Olam Azeh? They couldn't take it. So Basco went out and said, get back in the cave. I didn't let you out of here to destroy my, my, my world. Get back in the cave. So he went back in the cave for another year. 
They come out. Rebbe Lezer is still burning up everything. He can't take it. But Rishim Yochai looks at it and fixes it up. Two things bother me. If I were to ask you, why were these two people so critical of everything they saw? It's because they were in a cave for 12 years, totally separated from society, only davening, only learning. So of course, what are they going to do? They're critical of everybody else. So what in the world is going to help to send them back in the cave for another year? Send them to Miami for a year. That will, that will mellow them out. Don't send them to a cave. The cave is just, that's where the problem came about. What's another year in the cave going to help? And secondly, okay, now they come out, second year, after the year, and Rebbe Lezer's still burning up things. Send him back to the cave again. Shem Yochai learned his lesson. He can stay out. Why now is it okay for Rebbe Lezer to be out? I learned from that that people are too critical, not because they learn too much, because they didn't learn enough. It's the people who are really big people who have a v view and they can see everything and not be so critical. The people who are more critical are the small-minded people who only have one eye. You need two eyes. You need an eye to be critical, and you need an eye to be able to take that criticism and make it constructive criticism. If you're not critical, and everything in the world is okay. You're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay, nothing's okay. You need to be critical. You need to be able to fix things up in this world, but you need to be critical in a way that's constructive. So as long as there's a shutfish between the old Reb Shimon Bar Yochai and the young Reb Lezer, youngsters are very critical. Older people already get to be male. You should have seen what I was like when I was young. So, uh, and I see it in my children, my, my sons. They're real kanoyim. I think to myself, hey, I used to be like that also. Good. Someday they'll also mellow out in your session. But you need the older person who's more mellow and you need the younger one who's the big kanoy. You need two eyes. When there's two of them, Rebbe Lezer is burning up and Rebbe Shimba Yochai knows how to turn into something constructive, that's perfect. When both of them are critical or both of them are mellow, then it's no good. So, Mir Hashem, if we understand these Haftoris, we've already finished two of them. Divrei Yirmiyahu and Shimbu Dvar Hashem. We're already up to Chazon Yishayo. Think. See the bigger vision. Contemplate what it's all about. Be able to see it by guided by the Levim, by the Manhigim, and in a constructive way, not in a, in a uh, too critical way. Then Amir Tzashev, if we take all of that together, then we'll go through the Sholosh, the Puranusa, and we'll come to the Sheva, the Nechmasa, we'll come to the Nechama, because if we take heed of appreciating words, listening to them, and thinking about them, then we'll be able to misak in everything that brought all these korbanos and we'll be in it, then we'll be zocha that these days shouldn't be you may evil v'tzara, but you may soson v'simcha and be nepach liyomim tovim v'viyaskoel tzedek mehir of yomim.